Lyme disease in dogs, what it is, what exactly you need to look out for, and how to treat it if indeed you can. The Pet Health and Happiness Podcast from Bella and Duke, keeping you at the cutting edge of pet nutrition, behavior, and health with expert interviews, mythbusters, and more to ensure your pet lives a long, happy, healthy life. So, Dr. Brendan, without further ado, it's tick season. Uh, lots of people are asking these questions. What is Lyme disease? L Y M E, for those of you who don't know, Lyme disease. Okay, so it is a type of bacterium, which is, we call it a spirochete, actually not dissimilar to leptospirosis. Um, but this particular bacteria is carried in the digestive tract of ticks. And ticks have this wonderful way of when they feed, they do a little bit of uh, regurgitation of materials into the skin of the prey. Okay, we're going to call them prey, even though they're a parasite. Um, they stick their proboscis in. And after about um, 24 hours, they actually start a digestive process to be able to suck the blood out of um, the, the target animal. So that's when they inject this material that can be infected in some areas of Great Britain and around the world, you know, particularly in America, they have big problems with Lyme disease. Um, but in the UK, there are certain hotspots which we'll go through today uh, to look out for. Basically, a tick lands on your dog, for instance, it will, it has a bacteria in its stomach, whilst it's feeding on your dog, it will actually regurgitate, I know that sounds disgusting, this bacteria from the tick stomach into the skin and the bloodstream of your dog. So ticks themselves aren't necessarily toxic or they aren't the cause of Lyme disease, they're the way it gets spread. So Lyme disease is actually a bacteria, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a bacteria which transfers from the tick into your animal. Uh, I think there's a lot in deer as well. Is that right, Brendan? Yeah, so the areas that are particularly affected, I think we should run through that now. Good. <clears throat> Pretty much from the highlands of Scotland, um, down the west coast, so through Cumbria, um, so the Lake District, for those people that go there, we've got lots of clients that travel to the lakes for their you know, hiking and, and walking, um, all the way down through North Wales, then into Exmoor, Dartmoor, and then across the South Coast, so the New Forest, um, and then up into uh, East Anglia and the Threatford Forest and, and those sort of forest areas. And as you say, Deer have often been renowned as the one of the sort of intermediary hosts, if you like, for having this. So not only do they um, get affected by the Lyme's disease, but if they travel into new areas, then ticks that feed from them get infected from those deer. And that's how the Lyme's disease areas spread. And with warmer weather, you know, relatively warmer winters, um, uh, then we have seen an increased number of um, areas being affected by Lyme's disease. Okay. As well as, you know, stuff coming in from Europe um, before this, this year, you know, with a number of people traveling abroad, um, loads of other tick-borne diseases out there as well, but Lyme's disease is also current in those areas. Okay, so let's summarize that because this is some great information for everyone. Lyme disease, it's tick-borne, as in it's spread via ticks, from ticks to your companion animal or other animals that they might be feeding on, uh, even to humans. Yeah. It's a bacteria, it lives in the stomach of the tick, and it seems to be the busiest or most prevalent in areas around the UK where there are lots of deer. So we've covered quite a lot there. The next question then, Brendan, that everybody's searching for on the, uh, on the web and putting in the forum is what are the signs to look out for? What, what does it look like? How can you tell? We see lots of things of like shifting lameness, for instance. What are the signs that people need to look out for if they suspect the dog's been in a tick rich environment? So this is a really insidious disease, okay? Um, for humans, they can go for years 
being undiagnosed because it can give a waxing and waning symptom picture of, um, you know, flu-like symptoms, achy joints, you then can get, um, you know, me immune mediated diseases. So things which the body starts to see the bacterium alongside its own cells and then gets confused and starts to act on itself. So you okay. can get, you know, uh, extreme lethargy, um, high temperatures so they can get fluctuating temperatures from being relatively normal to suddenly being you know off color and having really high temperatures and then seeming to go back down again and so because of that waxing and waning people get confused you know us vets get confused as to what actually may be going on and often would see these as um you know, immune mediated diseases directly rather than necessarily there being that source of bacterium. Um, so there are specific tests now to look for the DNA of the bacteria to, to detect those within um, your pet's uh, system because they can affect all mammals, okay? Not just your dogs, okay? So cats, dogs, people, uh, can all be affected by ticks. And if you do find a tick on you, um, then one of the key things to look out for with Lyme's disease is this um, bullseye target uh, syndrome. So if you actually see that um, initial tick and then you get a red ring that seems to develop and then spread out from the tick bite, it is really important to think about getting a Lyme's disease test um, because often as it then dies away um, from the, the, the target that you've seen, it, the insidious um, symptoms I've just talked about can then start to develop and be with you for years. Oh, and you know, I, I'm listening to this, I'm wrapped, I'm interested. It's incredible, I've seen human clients who have had, for instance, Lyme disease, and they look at it and they say, oh, I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, they might have other things like the beginning of rheumatoid arthritis because their body has gone on to hypervigilance. And there are times when, for instance, we might have tested somebody and they come back negative for Lyme's disease. But ultimately, um, after say two or three weeks of like super supplementation with like glutathione, we test again and suddenly they're positive for Lyme disease because they've been so worn down by it. They're only now producing antibodies to this Lyme disease. And this is something that's been happening a lot. And that's why this new test that you're talking about, where you look for the actual bacteria itself rather than your body's response to it is a lot more accurate. Absolutely. And, the, you know, we know, let's talk about COVID for a moment. You know, we know that the lateral flow tests, um, which are looking at antibody levels, aren't 100% accurate. Yeah, there is a level of um, inaccuracies within those ELISA tests, which look for the antibodies, which means that you will find quite a lot of false negatives where you miss the infection that's going on, on top of which looking at relatively low levels of antibody production um, at various points within the infection can mean that, yes, you're absolutely right, you can miss it if you just look for antibodies, which is the beauty of the PCR, the, the looking at the DNA of those bacteria for a more accurate result. Right. So. We're covering, we've jumped onto how to test for it and the best way is to use a PCR test rather than an ELISA test. Everybody will put that in the show notes. The next thing is, uh, okay, so let's assume that the uh, responsible dog guardians or cat guardians that have had their dog or cat ch uh, checked, tested, PCR tested, come back positive for Lyme how do we address this and can we do it naturally? Okay, so conventionally, um, your vet will look at um, uh, the couple of options. One, if okay. you're at high risk, there is a vaccine now available, okay? Um, there is, uh, which actually, interestingly, when you produce the antibodies, actually starts to immunize the ticks too. 
Um, so it reduces the overall Lyme's disease in the areas where you vaccinated dogs uh, with this product. Um, that's just a ah, story. that's really interesting. So this is one of the, um, shall we say, outlying uh, cases of vaccination where you you've been super responsible and you're actually improving your own environment. Indeed. But that's an aside. We'll talk yes. about that in a moment. Yeah, um, so moving on. <laughs> moving on. Uh, the other parts are there is a um, particular doxycycline treatment. That's an antibiotic, yep. which is very specific for those type of infections um, and can be used. Also has some immune stimulatory effect as that particular antibiotic. So there are questions as to whether it's specific for the bacterium or whether it's actually more beneficial to boost the immune system to help the body get rid of the bacteria. But then the natural options are all about improving the immune system and you've talked about a couple of supplements yourself there for humans um similar things for our pets so uh what i was going to say is of course you can when alongside a traditional antibiotic if people have and they rightly so have lots of reservations about giving these because of the effect on their own pet's microbiome you can always supplement with funky probiotics especially if you go for the soil-based ones which we've talked about a lot with fidus for um, is they can be run alongside antibiotics without either interfering with each other but protecting your pet whilst dealing with that infection which is kind of cool Indeed. And, and look, you know, um, you've got a couple of products that are now available for re reducing the appetite of ticks for your pets. I think you've got ticked off. Um, oh, yeah. It's got some echinacea in there. That's really great for stimulating the immune system uh, as well. Um, just some of the other things within that product, you know, the apple cider vinegar, which can be really useful for promoting uh, normal gut flora as well. Remember, there's lots of pectins in the apple cider vinegar with mother you know which uh you know really help to uh, enhance the gut biome so lots of things that uh, that you can do naturally to just improve your pet's general health however because of the seriousness of disease please don't just use the product and then just think that's it i don't need to worry about it you should always check your dogs for ticks as soon as you've finished a walk in especially in those hot spots of areas and do look at the otom tick tools as the best way to remove ticks and i think we should go into how to remove ticks successfully right awesomeness so um i really love this it's so good to actually get down to the actual facts because if anybody tries looking on the internet then it's there are so many conflicting stories. I've even heard in the group from really, really experienced people that actually uh, Lyme disease doesn't affect raw fed dogs, um, which we know is not the case, but it's really good to explore this because quite often you can hear these things, they get repeated a lot and then suddenly they become a truth. So um, if anybody wants to actually look, and we won't go into it here, but they want a comprehensive guide on how to avoid ticks, we have an avoider plan. We will put a link to it here. It's a five-step approach. It covers all the bases. And just before Brendan goes into a really cool articulate explanation on how to really remove ticks safely and comprehensively, um, please, please, this is something really near and dear to my heart. If anybody tries to sell you a product which is going to 100% protect your dog against ticks, think twice. Why? Why? If ticks are super, super resilient, it's best to avoid and to remove and deter uh, and be vigilant, you know, to check your dog, as Brendan says, after every walk rather than use a chemical which is potentially so strong it could kill a tick what on earth is it doing to your dog so never go for the soft option or rather the easy option which is really quite a scary option for your dog's health so i've got just something here just to uh 
in preparation for today, uh, where um, I know kind of excited it, that for some of you guys who are with vets, conventional vets, and you'll be given uh, various products out there which um, will protect against ticks and fleas, uh, maybe even worm your pet as well. Um, it's really important that for some breeds, there are a couple of um, places that you need to look at um, to check that they can actually cope with those products. So he's, these are two UK companies, okay? And we'll put links in the podcast where you can actually do yourself a very simple um, swab test from inside the mouth of your dog. So you can do this yourself. You send it off to those companies and they will actually look for an MDR1 gene. Okay, so the okay. MDR1 gene is a multi-drug resistance gene if your dog has an absence of this capability of producing this special way for the brain to detox that actually it can be 200 times more susceptible to the side effects of those drugs including seizure coma and death wow okay. this so is gold brendan this is really good because it, let's put this in context I think, Brendan, you and I are really aligned on the fact that, yes, there is a spectrum between natural and pharmaceutical. And actually, we should be able to use all of them in an informed way. They're all super tools which are available to us. We can't just use exclusively pharmaceuticals if there's better natural ways. Sometimes natural ways just aren't strong enough or effective enough and we need to actually have some pharmaceutical intervention. So let's remain open mind. That's what's been holistic is, is using all of the methods to treat the dog as a whole. Um, so this is really good. It's a test or a look before you leap test. Absolutely. And, and inform your vet because it has consequences for all sorts of medicines from anaesthetic components all the way through to um, some of those antiparasitic treatments. Okay? Oh, I and love this. Brendan, so, I love the fact that you just pull that out of the bag. Okay. Kudos. <laughs> so the um, really important thing I say to my holistic clients is um, I always test and treat as in check your animal for these things, whether it be fleas, ticks, worms. Um, and I think for ticks, it's understanding the tick removal techniques. Lots of people have talked about using meths, using, you know, that's methylated spirits, using, um, you know, Vaseline to smear on the tick, using, um, you know, cigarettes to burn them off. Oh, you know, golly, all yeah. All sorts of horrible things that you talk about. Please remember, we said these bacteria rest in the gut of the tick. If you make that tick nauseous with loads of chemicals, it's going to vomit. And you actually are increasing the risk of it vomiting those bacteria into your dog. So stay clear of things going on topically to make your tick drop off because it's going to feel horrible, okay? And you have I've had people coming in having put petrol onto. The oh, tick. golly, I've heard that as well. Uh, please don't do that, okay? It's just not worth it. The best thing to do, don't take tweezers because the risk is you'll leave the mouth parts of the tick behind, okay? And you can accidentally it. squeeze the stomach contents of the tick into the dog. So all sorts of things like that. The best thing to do is use a little tool which looks a little bit like a claw hammer, okay, um, called an Otom tick tool. They'll love me for, for promoting them, but they are the best tick remover ever, okay? You literally slip the claw under the mouth parts of the tick, okay? You twist three times and then you lever out the tick and it just comes out entirety you can see the mouth parts the tick will still be wriggling obviously dispose of it safely um put it somewhere that's not going to crawl out onto you and 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 have another feast um but that's the best way to take those ticks out awesome so we're going to put a link to that in there and brendan maybe you could do as a little uh, mobile video 
the next time you come across one when you're out walking in the woods with Penny. I already have one on my mobile. I'll send you the one. I'll send you the one of me removing one from the back of my leg after a summer show. I said, I don't know what to say to that other than <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. <Grim> um, watching. <laughs> so, guys, we've covered quite a lot today. Um, we've covered how to treat it, how to look for it, what it is, where it is, how it's spread, and how to remove those ticks. Now, one thing you can remain relatively calm about is that if your dog does get a tick uh, and you are checking after every walk, if you're being vigilant, it's highly unlikely the tick would have even started to regurgitate into your dog. I think the fastest recorded is something like 16 hours, isn't that? Is that? Yeah, that's right. So they, the most companies will quote, as long as your product is being active within 24 to 48 hours, then you are more than likely to have protected them against the issues. I think the problem is that there are occasions yep. that feeding uh, has started within that 16 hour period. And so people say, well, 24 hours isn't quick enough um, in those. But, you know, again, if you're removing the tick within minutes of them being on the pet, or even if it's, you know, within um, six hours of being on your pet, then they're really unlikely to have cemented in. So remember, you know, ticks which um, have been in there and are feeding, they actually create a cement around their mouth parts to glue them in place so they don't just fall off easily. Uh, and that takes a bit of time for them to build up before they start the feeding process. So if you're getting in there with the tick tool, you're gonna get in there before they're really fastened in. Right, fabulous. So realistically, I mean, yes we want to avoid them and yes we can deter them by changing the smell with like ticked off and by feeding raw obviously we're actually improving your dog's immune system to fight them off uh, or to fight off uh, diseases anyway but the reality is if after every walk you are vigilant and you scrupulously go through and check your dog for ticks and remove them then and there within a few hours of the walk the likelihood of a tick transmitting anything is super low. So key areas to look out for, around the face and head, yep. around the ears, and just on the front of the chest here. So really those, if you have a long coated dog and you think it's gonna be impossible to check everywhere, check those areas first, okay? Those are probably gonna be the most prevalent areas that ticks as they uh, as they're walking through the grass you know the ticks are waving away on the ends of the grass stems and they're just waiting for your pet to come past them so they don't go in reverse okay so often as your pet is pushing through that undergrowth or those grasses they're going to pick up on the front so that's where you'll generally see them yeah i've occasionally found them in kismet's armpit as well yeah well but it's on the front as they hit and, and go in that area Okay, fabulous. Brendan, uh, great episode. Thank you for all of your insights, experience, and for sharing this so generously. It's appreciated, and uh, personally, I love learning something every episode. So thank you. Pleasure.